If you or someone you know is struggling with alcoholism or addiction, do not hesitate to reach out for help. You can find numerous free resources on our website, thebeginagainpodcast.com, and there are tons of resources and support networks available online, in person, or just a phone call away. You don't have to face this challenge alone. Welcome to the Begin Again Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes. On the Begin Again Podcast, we delve into the inspiring journeys of individuals who have overcome alcoholism and addiction and emerged as true trailblazers in entrepreneurship, business, sports, and beyond. Through authentic, uplifting, and profound conversations with our guests, we aim to shatter the stigma surrounding addiction and demonstrate that recovery can be a catalyst for remarkable success, strength, and resilience. We firmly believe that by listening to these accounts, you will be empowered to unlock your own potential, instigate positive change in your life, and contribute to the creation of a better world. So, get ready to be inspired and embark on your own personal journey of growth with the Begin Again Podcast. Welcome back to the Begin Again podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes, and today's guest is nothing short of incredible, Julian Bryant. Julian is a passionate marketer with a unique story. He dropped out of college after battling an opiate addiction from a wisdom tooth extraction that he had during his freshman year. His addiction spiraled out of control and eventually landed him in prison where he served a five-year term. While incarcerated, Julian studied every day, made a promise to himself to become so great at whatever he chooses to do that he would be undeniable. Once released from prison with nothing but a dollar and a dream, Julian worked relentlessly to make his dream of entrepreneurship come to life. Julian has made it his mission to help others through marketing. He is passionate about using marketing as a tool for good, and his company, Maniac Media Group, has helped other entrepreneurs who have unique stories to generate more than $10 million since its inception in 2018. Julian has been sober since December of 2016, and he has never turned back. Julian is also the CEO and co-founder of Beyond Driven, which helps married men get out of their own way and save their marriage by helping them sort through their internal conflicts and learn the skills to operate at their highest potential. It's stories like Julian's why I started the Beginning Again podcast to share with you that no matter how far down you think you may be, there is always hope for you. Your life is at stake here. One day at a time, you can not only change for the better, but you can go on and thrive and be the person you were meant to be. I know you're going to enjoy today's story. I sure did. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I'm really happy you're here, Julian. Thanks for coming and spending your time today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thank you for having me. No, I appreciate it. And let's, uh, you know, let's jump right in. What was it like growing up for Julian Bryant? For sure. And first, let me just start by saying, like, it's it's exciting for me to be here because I, I get invited to a lot of entrepreneur podcasts where we talk about just strictly scaling businesses and things like that. Mm-hmm. But it, it's it's great. It's a breath of fresh air to talk about the journey that I actually got here because it's been one hell of a journey. Let me tell you that. Um, so just growing up, just to kind of take you back there. I, I grew up in Sacramento, California. Um, my upbringing was, I mean, I guess it's all subjective, right? It wasn't too bad, but I grew up with a single parent uh, in a single parent household. With my mom, um, no father figure around. We grew up in kind of a rough area, but my mom did the best she could to kind of keep me out of that. So I was an academic um, and always heavily involved in sports. That was my goal is to make it to the NBA at all, at all costs. And I'm not the the five, five foot 11 guy trying to be a, an NBA star. Like I'm, I'm actually six, five. So it was a real possibility. I just, I just didn't have the skills to be able to take it there and uh, was met with a lot of you know, uh, things that got in that way, which we're going to dive into on this podcast. But um, growing up, I was really just focused on trying to do whatever I could to get it out of the get out of that neighborhood. And mm. to, I just I always felt like something was in me, like greatness was in me. I felt like I don't know. There was just always just this burning desire. Maybe I had a chip on my shoulder, not growing up with a father figure that just made me feel this it's like this dark energy that I just kind of use as fuel to like, I have to prove something to the world. I have to rise above what my current environment is to be able to, to be something great. I just always felt like there was this, this potential that I could never reach. And then that was always like the driving factor in me. They're just like, Oh, why are you so motivated? My mom was really, um, she would always prop me up. 
mm-hmm. always lead me with affirmations, a lot, a lot of love there. So I came from a very supportive household in that regard. She was the mom and the dad figure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that that instilled just this work ethic and this drive to want more because it was just me and her. We were kind of like the outcasts, even with our own family because of who she hooked up with and, you know, created with me, I always felt like it was just me and her just trying to, to make it in this world. So that's kind of like a, a little summary right there in terms of like how yeah. I grew up. Uh, I'm sure you, you want to kind of take this all that you. Oh, I mean, you bring up a lot of things that I can relate to chip on your shoulder. You know, I, I talk about a lot. I had a dad, a very active dad, and I would see stuff. My parents stayed together and, and, and I love them both very much. You know, they did the best they could for sure. But when I was a real young boy, I was very active and there was always, you know, there was some rough characters in and out of the house all the time. And I grew up in a in a real funny area, a great town, like a, a real na- awesome neighborhood. Sports was big. I grew up right down the street from a huge park, and that's all I did was play sports. My sport was was baseball. I'm 49 years old. I still like I'll be watching a game. Like man, I wish I was out there playing shortstop right now. Like that's yeah. still my dream. Like I still have it. I, I love sports. I love the competitive nature of it, and that's that's all I did. Uh, but I started developing at an early age, this, this chip on my shoulder, you know, made me very angry as a, as a kid and made me very resentful, but I would venture to say it also served me well throughout my years, you know, growing up, even to this day, you know, that competitive sort of nature, you know, I found myself working at a real, at a wall street firm, a real big bulge bracket. And I was, you know, I couldn't even answer an email. I didn't know, I had no college degree, nothing. And I'm surrounded by Ivy leaguers. And all I just kept telling myself was, fuck them. You know, I'm going to outwork them. I'm going to do this. And, you know, so in that aspect, that chip on my shoulder, you know, I think served me well. I've also been sober for 17 plus years. So I've sort of, you know, I know he's there and I know he's on on my shoulder, but he's kind of tamping himself down, if you will. So I totally relate, you know, I'm not six, five either. I'm, you know, I I list five, 11. I'm not sure if I'm fully five, (laughs) 11. I forgot to see you, but uh, no, I relate, man. You know, I relate too. And you mentioned your, your neighborhood, right? Like, so I grew up in this amazing neighborhood. There was a lot of rough people, you know, a lot of tough guys, you know, but we didn't know any better. And and they kind of looked out for us, you know, like they, we were like the young guys. Right. And, but what happened is you'd ride up, uh, up the block a little while, you know, a a mile away and hop over a couple of fences and you're in one of the wealthiest areas in, in the country called Sands Point. I grew up in Port Washington, Long Island. My town's called Manor Haven. It's uh, the blue collar, you know, blue collar area of the town. The, you know, not everyone was allowed down there. I didn't know this when I was a kid growing up. So it, it didn't affect me. It, was, it wasn't until later when people kind of pointed out like to me, like, well, that, that, that's, you know, that's, that's a tough spot where you grew up and um, everything's relative. Right. So mm-hmm. you can look at it and be like, wow, look at him. But I, I never once in my life thought like this was, you know, a scary place or, you know, kind of had to get out of here. But our school was a little weird because there was like a lot of wealth around us, but my group was, you know, not wealthy. And so I think we all kind of had a little chip on our shoulder, but funny, the whole same group, I'm still friends with them to this day. And we're all fairly successful. So I, I think we probably all in our own way had that chip on our shoulder that, you know, that made us work, uh, that were made, you know, worked for us for sure. But, you know, you give a good, uh, explanation. I see where you, where you were growing up. I've never been to Sacramento, but I got a good view of it. Take us to, you know, your senior year summer and you're going into your freshman year when, sounds like things start to maybe get the better of you, if you will. Yeah. So senior year going into uh freshman year of college, I felt like I was at the top of my, my game right there. I was, uh, you know, I felt untouchable. I think we all kind of feel that way when you're 17 and uh, the future is bright. You just, you feel good about things. I was a little arrogant at that time. And it wasn't until I actually went to my first semester in college when things started to really take a, a, a spin for the worse. Uh, I got my wisdom teeth extracted. And during this time, I was you know, trying to join a fraternity. And this is the first experience because I've been in school as like an academic and 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 uh, and playing sports my whole life, just trying to thrive in that sense. And now I'm in the party scene. So it was kind of a flip for the script. My mom, you know, kind of sheltered me to, to the most growing up mm. uh, as much as she could because she had to play that dad and mom figure. When I get into college, my grades start to decline a little bit for the first time ever in my life. And I, I'm taking these pills. I'm starting a party. And ne- next thing you know, I fall in love with the, the person that I am becoming when I'm under the, in- the intoxication of opiates. Mm. I become the bubbly life of the party. I'm like, wow, this is a part of me that I enjoy. 
And it was falling in love with like that characteristic that made the addiction speed up like crazy. So, you know, in the early stages of the, of the addiction, I, I couldn't even reckon, I wouldn't even call it an addiction at that time because you, you, you go through these phases of denial and not really understanding that I've never been exposed in that way. So I, I, I'm trying to balance this kind of two lives, I guess you can say. I have this street life that I turn to because now I'm trying to, I'm still going to school, but I'm trying to support an addiction. And then I'm also still going to these parties and trying to make, make it look like I don't have this budding addiction that continues to get worse and worse over time. But that didn't last very long. I, I ended up drop, dropping out after my first year and I fully dive into the streets because I'm from the area. I went to Sac State for college. Mm-hmm. Um, but after that second semester, I get academically disqualified. And now it's like my whole identity is getting crushed. Fast forward to now, I've really investigated like the thought process that I was going through at that time and how the addiction truly gets tied to your identity in such a major way. But also the other factors that were at play is I had an, I came from an abusive household. I came from a single parent household as well. And a lot of the, the support that I got from my, my mom, yeah, she's very supportive, but there is also an element of performance-based love in there. When I did well, mm. I felt good. When I didn't do well, I was punished, right? So when that is the root behind your addiction, and then the rest of your life is falling apart, and I've always attached my identity to my performance in school and sports, now I feel like my whole world is crumbling. And that's exactly the feeling that, that I had going through that, that in retrospect, I understand it, and it's easy to mitigate now but looking going through it at that time it just felt like my whole world is crumbling my friends are starting to distance themselves because they're like they think that i'm going down the right the wrong path which rightfully so i'm glad that they did distance themselves but it was a very hectic time as being 18 years old just trying to figure things out thinking that i had the world in front of me now it's like my whole life blueprint is changing and now i'm headed down a pathway that's dark that's lonely that I don't really know how to get myself out of. And uh, it just goes from this being this college kid who excels at sports and, and academics to now I have a full-blown addiction. I'm hanging out with people who also are supporting their own addiction. And whenever you're supporting addiction, you're doing crime. You're, you're selling drugs. You're doing whatever you can to support, especially an opiate addiction that is just a, the monkey on the back, the hardcore thing that just grips your inner... <laughs> <laughs> your inner being by all means. Um, and that was, that was really where it started to go after that first year in college. That's where everything started to really spin out of control. That's, that's really amazing. That seems like that was a real, that happened real fast. You seem to have a real self-awareness, even though you kind of touched upon, you know, you were becoming addicted to these opiates and maybe at first you didn't really realize or I could speak for myself. Like, I didn't even know what it meant to be addicted. Like, I didn't understand the word. I didn't understand the word alcoholic, where everyone around me tell you, like, that guy's going down the wrong path. That guy's on the wrong path. But I was, I couldn't see it at all. I was just so in my my own world. But you go from, you know, excelling in academics, excelling at sports. For, you're in college. This happens with your wisdom tooth. And you get hooked on opiates. And you... I mean, a matter of months, your life pretty much turns a, f- a complete 180 from where you're going in, in a bad way. I say the word 180 all the time in a good way, because where I'm right now is a complete 180 from where I was, you know, 17 plus years ago. Like you wouldn't even recognize me, uh, to be honest with you. And if I knew myself back then, I, I can't believe I'm sitting here doing a podcast, talking to you know people like yourself about entrepreneurship, about the real life stuff. You know, I had this sort of epiphany, if you will, that like things I was ashamed of, getting in trouble, being arrested multiple times, you know, assaulting a police officer at 16 years old, and everything that goes with being a, a real young kind of troubled. I I'll back up for a second too. When I was, I'd say. You know, up until June uh, freshman year in high school, like I excelled in academics too. I was the top of my class always, but I think I started a little earlier. By the time I got to high school, freshman, you know, I barely graduated high school. I mean, I had to like really struggle just to even graduate on time in high school, and that was not the path I was on earlier. Um, but you know, you seem like you have an amazing mom too, man. Like, because you know, you mentioned she she wanted to, you know, she wanted a baby, she wanted to take care of you. And I have two young ones now too, and I totally relate to your mom a hundred percent. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's a beautiful thing too to have, you know, you have that mom and I'm thinking about her too, right? Cause there's the, you know, there's the person that's in the addiction. There's you and I that are in it. Right. But then there's the family members that you can argue maybe are, are hurting more and the opiate is a crisis and you were right in the middle of it. So you're in, you go from, like I said, excelling at academics, top of your class sports to bailing out or dropping out of, out of college. And now you're doing street life. How are you doing now? Tell us what happens from here. Yeah. So at that point, it went on for about two years of me just trying to support my addiction, selling drugs, be able to do whatever I want to do, you know, just test trying different drugs, Molly, heroin, Coke, all the all the stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, the thing well, actually it was at opiates for a while, and then it transformed to heroin eventually, as, as I alluded to right there, uh, toward the end of that that two years. Um, and then when I got to, to the graduation of heroin, I guess you can call it, uh, that's when things really take an, another spin for it. So it was a, a maintenance kind of period, but then the heroin just started to take me over like crazy. I'm smoking it, tried shooting it a few times and it wasn't really my thing until it progresses. And then it's just yeah. whatever happens. But I got to the point where I'm, I'm smoking the heroin on foil and I got bronchitis and I'm still trying to smoke. I, I've taken the bronchitis pills and every time I take a hit, I'm choking and it's just crazy. Just killing yourself yeah. every day. And then to support that addiction on the other side, I couldn't hold a job. I did for the first year, but in that second year, now I'm just purely doing crime. I'm hanging with people who are all they do is sell drugs and they rob people and they break into houses and they're they're doing really bad things. And mm. that's where my life started to to move toward. At first, I was hesitant. I, I didn't do those things. I'd hung around those people. But you hang around the wrong group for long enough and eventually it starts to influence your behavior. Your worldview starts to change. You start to not care about anything, really. You have mm. the drugs that are numbing you. So what is it at that point? What does your life really mean? I felt numb and I continued to numb myself to just escape reality because the the reality that I was living in was not something that I enjoyed at all. So I tried to create a different reality and to be still to have that that human need of being accepted by some group, that validation in some way, because I was a weak man at that point. I was a young man, very weak, that I wanted to be accepted by some group. And the only way to be accepted was to be evil, was to do evil, to do bad. And to do things that weren't aligned with who the true character that I truly felt myself from being at, you know, at a young age, but now I'm just on a whole different path. And I had to accept that as my reality. But the only way for me to accept that as my reality was to numb myself, which is, is that really acceptance? So it went like that for two years until I ended up in prison. Mm-hmm. And the way I ended up in prison was um, this guy that I sold drugs to, he actually owed me money and I met back up with him and set it up to rob him because he forgot about him owing me money. And I just wanted to get my money back and however way I could. So we met up at a parking lot in a mall, got into the back of my car and I pulled out a gun on him and told him to give me what I need. He kicked me in the face and I cocked the gun and I pointed at him. I said, if you kick me one more time, I'm going to blow your fucking brains out. And we drove around the park or the, the parking lot. It was, uh, I had a driver. I was in the, the, um, passenger seat and the guy was locked in the back, the child locks on and I pistol whip him in the face until he screamed to let him out. And we let him out. And that was that, man. I'll never forget it. It was a very dark moment in my life. It was a series of events that led up to that moment that really just, you know, that's, that was the major fork in the road. Yeah. You talk about, you talk about going dark, right? Because I can relate to the darkness. And, you know, again, I keep thinking about it. young Julian, you know, this again, excelling at academics and sports and, you know, start to numb yourself. You don't feel comfortable in your own skin. So you numb yourself more. You're not accepted anywhere. So you're accepted with the wrong people. And pretty much again, uh, to use the term one more time, a complete 180 from where you were. Right. And, you know, now you're, now you're, you're down this whole other path and you're in this whole other world. And, you know, these things were said to me earlier as well. Like, you know, you can think who you want to be Gary, but your actions are not who you are, who who you think you want to be, you know, like you might have some good stuff. You might have a good heart, right. But what you're doing here, man, is not good heart stuff and you're hurting people and you're scaring people 
and you're starting to get a rap sheet, you know, like you're going to, you're facing, you're going to go to jail. You're going to face prison time too. So you have this major episode in your life and you mentioned getting accepted too. I can relate to that too. I mentioned I was 16 years old. It was a night before Thanksgiving, a big night in my town. I think it's a big night in most towns. And I snuck into the bar. I was with my older cousins all day. I snuck into the bar, fight breaks out, spills into the street with my cousins. Cops go to him, arrest my one cousin and, you know, 16 year old, 100 and I don't know, 45 pound Gary youngest guy, smallest guy in the bar by a lot, uh, gets arrested for, you know, first degree assault, breaking a police officer's nose. Cause I went over there and just clocked, clocked him, you know, and woke up Thanksgiving morning arrested, you know, in Nassau County lockup. That's one of my real big events. That was a turning point because in town, in my neighborhood, they started looking at me a lot differently. Like I, lack of a better word, they kind of started re- like respecting me in a different way. Like, oh man, he's, he's the real deal. He's, uh, he's the guy that did that. And this, you know, he, he, assaulted that cop and you know, that cop's this and that and whatever it may be, you know, all the BS that goes with kind of right. the street life, if you will. And so you have your event, which is, that's a hell of a story, man. Right. And I appreciate you being so open and honest and sharing it with us here. Cause like I said, that's going to help someone. Someone's going to resonate with that one. And so you go, this guy, this happens with him and you get, you get locked up for it and you get from this, you get five years. Is that right? Yeah, I would even say to back up just a little bit because I didn't get caught right away. Mm-hmm. It took about a month. And let me tell you that that month before I got caught was the longest month of my life. I mean, it, it's almost bringing me to tears just thinking about all the events that happened in that month because it it that event just turned something in me that it, it just completely changed. It, it was honestly, I was on prison saved my life. And I'll always say that is because if I continued on that path and I never got caught for that crime. I would be dead for sure. Mm. Because after that event happened, I went back, I was accepted. I was doing crime. I was doing these things that, you know, I was trying to be accepted for. After that, I I continued to sell drugs and, you know, I'm selling pounds of weed or whatever. And and this guy sets me up and I, I get robbed on a main street, busy middle of the day. I give the guy the bag and he tries to run away and we're fighting over the bag, three pounds of weed in there. And then I didn't see his friend come up, but his friend comes up, reaches a gun inside of the car, fires twice and misfires. And then he fixes the gun right when he fixes the gun. Uh, I let go of the guys uh, of the bag and the guy just barely hits the guy's arm just enough to alter the way that the bullet goes. And he fired twice. Boom, boom. And it went as I'm reaching over, it went through my sweatshirt twice into the armrest of the car. And they just ran off and I just sat there for a moment like, man, here is an, another like sign of like, what am I doing? How many close calls can I get before I actually change? And you would think that something, an event like that would make you change the trajectory of your life, but it's not until I hit rock bottom. I had to learn the hard way for me to, to fully get the lesson. So it was, it was a series of events like that, breaking into houses, things like that. Always trying to rob drug dealers, not just innocent people. I don't know if that makes it any better, but yeah, I think it does. (laughs) Yeah. But that was, uh, that was where I was at just in this dark place. And then finally I'm carrying a gun everywhere, looking over my shoulder, all these things. And I, I get pulled over one day and finally get, uh, get wrapped up and they bring me to, I had no idea why I was being uh, drug off to jail. And, um, I get there, I'm in the holding cell. I'm detoxing from, from heroin, sweating bullets. And, and I I'm there until about like 3 a.m. 3 a.m. before they actually book me for something. And they're like, Oh man, I'm like, can I go home? And like, go home. <laughs> You're not going anywhere, man. You have four felony counts. I was like, what, what, what do you, what do you mean? four felony counts. He's like, yeah, we have you booked in for false imprisonment, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon and kidnapping. He's like, good luck. You're going to have to fight this for a long time. And I was just, the, it was like my soul just left my body. I call my mom, I'm breaking down. I just, I'm like in disbelief. It's almost, it was like, it felt like I was just in this, this nightmare, like that I couldn't wake up from. And I felt that same feeling for years when I got sentenced and just waking up in jail just like having the dream that, oh man, I, I, I'm having this nightmare that I'm in jail. And then I wake up and I'm like, fuck, I'm actually in jail. I'm here. Mm-hmm. And I'm not here just for a night. I'm not here for just, you know, maybe a few days or whatever. Like I'm, I'm here fighting a case that could be looking at a life sentence. 
So I, I fought the case for about two years um, in jail. You know, there's race rights. There's all these things that go on in jail. And jail sucks. Prison sucks. All this, it all sucks. But I deserve there. I deserve to be there. And I would say that it was the biggest blessing that ever happened to me because the one thing when I'm actually started to settle, when the, the fog started to go away from me being in this, this days of, of the drugs, of heroin and everything like that, and I start to finally come back to myself. It took mm-hmm. about, say about two, three weeks for me to be like, oh man, I'm I'm here and I'm dealing with lawyers. I'm dealing with all these court cases and everything like that. That's when I just started to turn everything around. I started to really just turn to God. I'm like, God, just give me the answers. Like, I promise if you help me get out of here, I will help others change their life. I will do whatever I can to never come back here and, and to, to do right. And to follow your path is to be the creator and to walk in your light. And, I, and that was the one guiding thing. But the second thing that came to that is I started to think about all the damage that not only I was doing to my mom, my family and, and everything like that, seeing all the, the friends that I so-called had completely go away had no one it was just my mom and later my my girlfriend who is now my wife came in the picture about a year later it got me thinking about all the damage that I was doing to my body to my brain so then I just it's something clicked in me that which could be divine it was like hey the answer is within yourself you just have to pay attention to the calling that you've been numbing for so long it clicked mm-hmm. in me to just focus on optimizing myself as, as much as I could. So I was reading every day. I was exercising every day. And the things that I was reading was not just some crime books, like a lot of the people are reading inside of jail and how to do more crime or to fantasize about like these ideas of crime. It was psychology. It was how to think bigger, how to set goals, the psychology about my addiction and understanding like all of these little things that set the foundation for where I am today. It, it was it was me priming my mind and readjusting the inputs to myself to now realign my whole worldview because that's what I needed is a realignment. And jail just happened to be the thing that did that for me. It, I had to hit rock bottom for me to finally recalibrate, to realign and to find my true purpose in life. That is unbelievable. You know, you say hit rock bottom, right? Bottom, what I learned is bottom, there's always a there's always a lower bottom, right? If people are listening to this, like your bottom could have been a couple of years earlier, right? And same with me. And but we we can always find a new bottom. We keep getting lower and lower, and there's always another lower bottom. You mentioned the divine stepping in. I, I have a similar, not the same as you, but similar where I can't explain what happened to me. I, I was well into alcoholism and addiction. I had tried it. I had been in rehab. I went back out. I fought it for four years. Uh, same things kept, you know, worse story after worse story. And I don't know what happened to me, you know, 17 plus years ago. I was all alone as I always was. I was sitting in my apartment all alone and something came over me. I, I My mom's one in 10. I'm the first grandchild on my mom's side. And I have like 20 something younger cousins. And I remember thinking about them like, is, and they kind of looked up to me and I'm thinking, you know, is this what you want them to look at? Like, is this what you want them to think is like, okay, behavior? Like I didn't want to, I don't know why, even to this day, something came in. You mentioned so much stuff too. Like, how did you, how do you think in your words, how do you think you had such clarity? Cause you speak with such articulation and clarity on what was happening to you at that point And to, to dive in on Julian, on inside, on your mind, on how to really come out. When you do come out, you're going to be prepared to really kick ass in life, which is what you're doing today. What Can you put a finger on it? I always had that fire in me and it was just tapping back into that source. And the source was God. Mm. And I, I put this quote down. I was looking for this quote. That's what I was looking down is I was thinking about this the other day. Because there was actually, I was walking out of a liquor store, getting some some items, whatever. And this guy, he was reaching for some change in his pocket. He couldn't pay for a water. I'm like, I got it, man. Don't worry about it. You can tell he's just blaze and everything like this. And he's coming out of the store and his his buddy's just like, oh, what? The? Like he dropped a dollar or something like that. He's like, oh, what the fuck, bitch? Like all this ghetto shit. And I'm like, man, I used to be there. And I, I totally... Like get where these these kids are at. It's just they're lost, they're dazed and confused, and all this 
you know, in that state. And I, I put down some, like a thing in my notes and I said, you can poison the mind, you can poison the body, but you can't poison the soul. You can only suppress it. The soul is God. The soul is abundant love. And when you, you can suppress it as much as possible, when, but when there's nothing to suppress that true inner self and you really start to tap into that message and you accept all of that from above, you start to find the answers. Everything comes from within. We already have the answers in us but we're suppressed by whatever it is, whether it's addictions or it's the self-sabotaging behavior, whether it's gambling or whatever it is, if it's lust and all these sinful activities that can, that can cause us to distract and suppress the true message that's within us. That's when you're, you're silencing the only answer that you need. And that's, we're seeking these answers, but we're trying to seek it in the same state that we got ourselves in the same fucking problem. You can't see, you can't find the answer in the same state that you caused the fucking problem. And that was the thing that happened when I went into jail is I was finally able to remove all of those suppression, suppressive states. And even though I was in an emotional distress, I had to accept that there was things that I could control and there was things that I couldn't control. And the biggest thing that I could control at that moment was the fact that I can control my emotions and how I respond to them. I can control how my mental state is because I can't fucking get myself out of this situation. So I'm either going to be a victim to my c- circumstance and continue to be in this self-sabotaging, you know, state, whether that, you know, in, in that sense, it's what are you going to do? Get into fights and cause issues, or you can control what you have inside of you, which is your emotions and your mental state and try to make the best of your situation. And that's what I chose to do because what something you said about potential is you can go or you didn't say potential, but that was that's how I take it, is that you can hit rock bottom, right? But that rock bottom can can go deeper and deeper and deeper. And the same is true for rising and growth. So that's why I kind of flipped the, the scale on its side and I look at potential as a spectrum. You know, we can go either or, but the thing about potential, it's never realized in both directions. Mm. And if you tap into the true potential of what God is, what the universe is, whatever you want to call it, whatever your true beliefs are, it's always growing. It's always ever expanding. And that's your true potential. And hopefully you put it in the positive direction. You know, that is, that is unbelievable. It's infinite, right? The potential is infinite. And I love, I love because all we talk about is, you know, you can go deeper, you can go lower. We don't talk enough about, yeah, you can, but guess what? You flip it around, you can go higher than you can possibly ever imagine. As long as you're tapped in to the source, right? And so you find what you're at least I'm taking away because I'll relate to my own is you're finding your higher power. You're finding God. It sounds like you call him God. I call my higher power God as well. You know, I find God. I was sober for a bunch of years, man, before I even realized like there's a higher power at work here. And, you know, I can even mention this podcast, like this podcast is a, has be very quickly become something bigger at work for me because the word podcast, Julian, was not ever on my radar. Like I wanted to do things. I wanted to start businesses. I wanted to do things on the side. I had a lot of, I'm 49. I still have more dreams and goals than, than I ever have in my life. I'm not even, I can't even put a full finger on how I got into podcasting. And certainly this topic was not on the radar, you know, like I am very active in AA. I'm, I go almost every single day, you know, and, and it saved my life. Finding God really saved my life. But, you know, I was in, I'm in these meetings and even early on, I'd hear these unbelievable stories of people who turned their life around in sobriety, found a higher power, found spirituality, changed their life around. And I said to myself, you know, there should be more than 15 people in this room that that are hearing this. There's people out there that can benefit from hearing this story because, Early on, when I heard like my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, like you said, I love that. Uh, she had given me a book, and she's the only one that stuck with me as well. Like she, she saw something in me that I never even saw, and certainly would and everyone else around me didn't see, or if they did see, I had buried it and it was gone, and and that potential was poof, you know, burnt. It was gone. But she sent me, she gave me a book. It was called Courage to Change, and it was these stories of like I remember Pete Townsend from the Who was in there, and he's just you know, guys talking about living in sobriety. And I'm like, wow, these guys do it too. Holy shit. Like I thought my life was over and little, I know my life was just beginning. That quote you said is unbelievable. And, but you just tap into the human potential, right? Cause if you are aligned with a, with a higher power, we, again, I call God and you believe in yourself, 
yes, every, the, the bottom is always lower, but the higher is always higher, which is, you know, I think that's, again, that's the message. That's the, we can always, everyone kind of talks about the low stuff. I want to talk about the positives and what's that, what's available and what we can accomplish in our lives. And again, I love what you said too. You said potential. It's, you know, it's kind of always moving, right? It's never fully fulfilled. I think it's because as we're growing, and again, I'm speaking for myself, like as I continue to grow and as I want to grow and as I want to continue to learn, the goalpost, if you will, gets gets higher and it gets a little further away. And mm-hmm. so does my so does my bottom. So does my low. My standards are raised. You hear that a lot. My standards are raised. You know, I believe that I can accomplish so much more today than I ever did. And again, I'm 49 years old, but I, I read more than I ever have. I want to continue to learn. I need to use this brain of mine. But you you talk about so much, man, and it's such an awesome message of inspiration and hope. So you're in there, right? And you get this clarity, you tap in, you know who's the boss and the boss is your higher power and you're going to stay close to him. You start working on your mind. You start working on your body. You're in there for a total of five years. Do I have that right? Yeah, I was just under five. I was sentenced to five years, but I did less than that. Yeah. Less. So you have this, you've been in there reading. I'm, I'm guessing you're probably becoming sort of a model inmate in there. And from what it seems like, it would be, that's a guess from how, how you're portraying what you're doing, controlling what you control. Don't mm-hmm. do stupid shit. Right. So you come out in 2016. Is that right? 2016. Yep. Yeah. So that final week is when I came up with that saying is I'm going to be so great at what I do that I'm undeniable. And the reason I came up with that is, is actually I I wrote a journal um, called hundred days of freedom. The last hundred days I said, I want to leave here with something other than just like the memory, the bad memories and all this kind of stain of this, this experience, because I was, I was doing everything I possibly could to, to level myself up mentally. Um, I was going to school every day. I had the the uh, remote college, so they would ship in like assignments and everything. So I was doing college work in there. I got my AA um, while in college or while in prison, excuse me. And that last hundred days, I was just writing the journal. I wanted to document it. And then that last week, I was it was hyper focused on I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I really going to do when I get out here? And I was stressing myself out about it. I was really concerned because. The world is a little bit different. It's, it's you know, things change. <laughs> so I didn't have any friends. It was just, everything was different. I never kept like a job or anything. And I'm like thinking, like I'm getting in my head, ruminating about the fact that I'm going to have this, this, you know, mark on me, this stigma of like, ah, he has this bad experience. So I'm like, how am I going to get a job that will support the goals that I have, these ambitious goals that I have that I've been writing every day and going through it every day, reading at night, morning and night, like their affirmations. I got to last week. I said, you know what? No matter what I do, I'm going to be so great at what I do that I'm undeniable. It won't matter what my past is. It won't matter everything that that has happened up to this point in my life. It's about what I'm going to create now. And I'm going to accept the fact that this journey is going to be hard. There's going to be times that I'm going to want to give up. There's going to be a lot of doubt, a lot of people throwing shade at me, throwing all of their insecurities and fears about me making something for myself and turning it around because people want to see you succeed, but they don't want to see you do better than them. That's right. <laughs> and That's right. <laughs> and I, I accepted the fact that all of these things were going to be factors against me, but me being able to prevail and to overcome all of these things that are stacked against me makes me even that much better. And that makes me great. And focusing on greatness, focusing on mastery was the one thing that I knew would help me rise above the rest. And to be able to use this, this event, this, this horrible event that, that I went through as power and not as this handicap, but more as, as power, as an advantage, as something that I can show that people can rise above whatever their adversity is. And when I got out, I kept that fire as long as I could. I kept it. I, I, um, I got a, a construction job right away. So I was, I got into that and construction, it's hard work, but you make decent money for me to get out and to do that right away. was a lifesaver because I was able to get my, uh, PO, my parole officer off of my back. I had a job. That's the biggest thing they want is like, you get a job. I'll leave you alone. And as long as you're not doing drugs and hanging out with criminals, like whatever, I'll leave you alone. So I got the job. I was 
having some foundation there. I, I helped my wife get her business started, eyelash extension business. And I was starting to learn. Uh, I was finishing up my school and then I was also learning how to run ads online and learning all of this digital marketing stuff that I'm in today. Right. So I saw an ad and I was just curious. I'm like, what the heck is this? Like you can make one to $10,000 a month by helping local businesses with social media. I'm like, if that's like a real opportunity, like I want to see how I can do that. Yeah. So that brought me down the rabbit hole. So I have all these things and every day that I would, you know, from getting out, I had this fire in me and every day that I would commute from Sacramento to San Francisco in the morning, it's an hour and a half drive, no traffic. But after work, it's like three hours because the traffic is just ridiculous. Yeah. So that was a blessing though, because I had this, I was, it was in my old uh, Nissan. I had this, um, like little metal, uh, mag magnet, like holder for an iPad. And I would just put YouTube on my iPad and just put it there on the dash. And I'm just learning the whole time there and back morning, wake up three 30 in the morning. I'm learning after work, three 30 PM for the next three hours. I'm learning. And I just obsessed on like, how can I get to my goals? Because I made a decision. I made a decision. It all started with commitment. It all started with the fact that I am convicted mm. to this goal. And that's actually a newsletter that I'm, I'm, this is a shameless plug. I'm going to have a newsletter. Oh, do it, on. Do it. The, the convicted is coming out maniac media newsletter, which is, is a similar purpose to, to what you have on this podcast. But anyway, we'll dive into that later. The, the whole thing that drove me is that I was convicted to this goal, blind conviction. Nobody was going to tell me that I wasn't going to reach this goal. Yep. And I did whatever it took. And it started with YouTube videos until I was able to get some, some cash for me to invest in myself. And the first, you know, every time I would have a little bit of extra cash, I'm putting it back into myself. Mm. I started investing in myself so I can level my skills because that's what it came down to. It was identifying what are the things that are in between where I'm at right now and where I want to go. And the yeah. biggest thing at that time was the skills. I lacked skills. I lacked skills that were highly desired by the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And when I re when I realized and I recognized that, oh, it's just a skill that I can learn. It's not something that, you know, is just for only special people or only people that, you know, are kept to the rich, like a secret, like, right. no, all that's BS. And that was right. like, a, that's a mental block that I had to also overcome, like beliefs about money. There's so many things and mindset that early on you have to learn how to overcome. But the biggest thing is me learning how to, or learning that I needed to acquire the skills that people actually care about. And when I learned the skills and I was applying it, I was putting it into, into motion and starting to get that experience. Now I started to get confidence to push it out to the, to the marketplace mm. because competence leads to confidence. Okay. So it just continued on this cycle for a while until I, I made the leap from construction to now fully diving into my own business. I, I saved up $20,000 from construction. I'm investing, got <laughs> putting my investments on credit cards and doing that, whatever I could, but now shift everything that I had. And I've went fully into my business around, it was like the end of 2017. So it took me about a year, you know, a little bit more than a year to get to um, stepping into like the consulting piece. And I think the biggest thing for me at that time, it wasn't even it, like the lack of skills was one thing, but the mindset too, mm. is like when you feel like uh, an imposter, when you feel like you don't work, you're not worthy of stepping into this next version of you, that's a lot to uh, overcome. It's very hard. And that that's relevant in even in losing weight or ditching an addiction. There's a lot of things that tie into our worth that if we can't, if we cannot feel worthy within ourselves, it's hard for us to break out of that broken identity and these broken stories that continue to keep us stuck in this lower version of us that no longer serves our next version. And it, it, it takes us rewriting ripping up that fucking story that no longer serves you and writing a new page. Cause you deserve that next chapter of you. That, oh my God. That's unbelievable. Like, uh, imposter syndrome, right? That's a real thing. That is a real thing that I, I deal with. I, I could deal with fairly regularly. 
right now I'm in a good spot. So I'm good now, but I'll, you know, I'll be a week or two and I'll, I'll go down the rabbit hole. Poster syndrome is, is a bad, is a real thing. Right. And my, I have a good friend always tells me, you know, I'll talk to him and he's like, why don't you start telling yourself a good story, but you take it a step further, right? You're like, dude, that is your past programming of your book that you think is already written, which you don't even realize you rip those pages up and you are writing a new page right now. And you talk about mindset and you talk about progress in anything is the biggest motivating factor in anyone's life. So like if you're losing weight and you have all this other stuff, you want to get the girl, whatever it may be, right? It's, it's a struggle, but you get on that scale and you lost two pounds, boom, you know what? You're a little more motivated. Same thing with a building a business. You know, you get someone that picks up the phone when you're cold calling, whatever it is, you're going to be a little more motivated that, you know what? There is that, that voice inside. You're like, maybe I can do this. And it starts to overcome. But how do you personally, like, do you have a, uh, a program of sorts, or how do you overcome those, those imposter syndrome moments? Or do you just, are you so kind of in clarity and aware right now that you just see like, okay, that's imposter syndrome, rip that up. Let's write a new page. How do you, how do you work through it? I'd say now I'm in a place where I don't get imposter syndrome because I'm surrounded by accomplishments, a level of, of gratitude at this point. I still struggle at times. I get stressed out, overwhelmed. I'm human. You know, things happen mental. I, I go through mental ups and downs for sure. But the stage uh, like where I'm at compared to where I was when I first got started, complete 180. I mean, there's the term again, right? Yeah. But um, getting started early and overcoming imposter syndrome, it really came from not, you know, there there is the benefit that you just said in terms of um, the the little wins that you're stacking up. But that's a huge part for sure. Absolutely. But it's also important for you to look at the lagging indicators because a lot of the leading indicators, you're losing weight, you're uh, getting you know, uh, more sales or whatever, you're getting new clients. Those are leading indicators. Yeah. But it's important to look at the lagging indicators as well to overcome imposter syndrome. Are you doing better than you were the day before? Mm. Those are the things that help. And, and better doesn't always have to mean that you're getting new clients, you're getting sales, because there's going to be dips in, in those things. You yeah. might hit a roadblock in your weight loss journey and you're not losing weight. But right. guess what? You're drinking more water, you're taking more steps, you're doing more of these things. And that's something you should be proud of too. And I think that if we attach ourselves too much to the outcome, sometimes that can get us into a spiral. Uh, that is hard to get out of too. And it's important for us to look at the, to zoom out and to look at the bigger picture of you making those 1% increases every day and not just looking at like a 10 or hundred X increase on a short frame. Sometimes we have, it's important to give ourselves grace and continue to just do the work and be consistent. If we focus on being consistent with our actions, eventually it catches up. Absolutely. It just takes a lot of time. It's com it's compound interest in yourself. Oh my God. I love that compound interest in yourself. I couldn't agree more with everything you just said. You know, it's, it's the old adage, like, you know, you build the wall, right? One brick at a time. It really is just one brick. And the only person I need to be better at is better than I, than the person I was yesterday. Right. Like those kind of sayings and cliches, they're real, they're real to me. And, you know, I, I told you at the beginning, I don't really like do like interview questions, but there was one question I did want to ask you and you kind of touched on it. And uh, it's this, you said, zoom out. Like, do you ever zoom out and look at yourself and say, you know, like, Hey man, I've overcome a whole hell of a lot, man. Like, do you ever like give yourself sort of that quiet, like proverbial pat on the back? Cause we do, I don't know. We, we live in a world where, you know, it's, it's cutthroat, right. And you got to out hustle everyone. You got to outwork and you got to be up this early and, you know, and I, maybe it's a, my age. I'm starting to question, you know, this is a guy I get up at four 30 in the morning every day. So I still kind of have it, but I'm starting to just kind of question a little bit, but do you ever, I feel like we live in kind of a society where, you know, we don't, we don't give ourselves a little credit for the wins. Like, dude, you have, what a story you have. You ever overcome so much, Julian, like, do you ever zoom out, give yourself that pat on the back? hundred percent. I, I, I don't do it as often as I probably should just full transparency, but I definitely do take the moments to zoom out and to just think about the journey. Cause it's been one hell of a journey. And I talk about it a lot with my team. If they're going through mental slumps, I think that that's the time when 
I step in and share my story. So that's a time of reflection. Moments like this, hopping on podcasts and talking about the journey is, is a time of reflection. And also every year, celebrating my day out, <laughs> me getting out of, out of uh, prison, which is June 15th. So it was just two weeks ago. That's also a time of reflection too. And usually leading up to that. And I, I just kind of go through and just think about everything. But yeah, I definitely do zoom out and, and think about that from time to time. Good. You should, you know, part of this podcast is I want to celebrate stories like yours. And, you know, I'm listening to you and all I'm thinking is, you know, I hope you celebrate yourself, you know, a little bit or maybe more than a little bit. I think that's maybe part of the message as well. I feel like, again, we live in a society where, you know, we can't kind of do that. And we got to just keep going, going, going. But, you know, giving ourselves that self-love, man, I think that's important as well. Uh, something 100%. I certainly need important uh, improvement on a lot for sure. Um, but man, you talked about so much stuff. I got to ask you this. There's a book. There's, I mean, there's multiple books there. You got to be thinking about putting that hundred day thing in, into, into writing. Have you thought about that? I've thought about it. Um, I think at some point I'll, I'll do some version of it in, in a book, like a published version of it, but I would have to add more to it. Cause it's just like a journal random thoughts that <laughs> so, just some of it's really funny. I, I read through it uh, occasionally. My, my wife actually just made me uh, like a, I think I have it right here. I don't know where it is, but it's a spiral version of it. Yeah. 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 Right here. So there it is. It's already in print. All right. That's yeah. A spiral version of it. So it's, uh, it's, it's funny to just read through some of these things, but a lot of, you know, not, it was kind of surprising, but it's also it's fun just to go through this is, is, I, I kind of prophesized, I guess you could say, or manifested a lot of the things where I'm at today. I wrote it on paper first. Unbelievable. Cause that's something I believe in too. I mean, that's, that's real stuff. And I don't think it's like, you know, hokey pokey, like, you know, who's someone said, you know, you can write down an affirmation, you know, but you can't just go have a sandwich after that. You have to go put the work in, like you have to put, you have to work every single day towards whatever it is that you want to accomplish, but anything is possible for sure. That was what they, I did write down the hundred days. I'm like, oh man, that's a book, but there, you had so much other stuff that you're going to have to share with the world too. And I hope this podcast is, uh, is a conduit to that, uh, one of these days. And I know for sure that you help you help me today. And I know you're going to help someone out there for sure today as well. I love but, that, man. Uh, so tell us about what are your main goals and tell us about your businesses and where can we find you or anyone that, uh, wants to go, you know, see what you're up to today. As far as your businesses, where can we find you and, and what's Julian doing today? Yeah. So my main focus right now is beyond driven. We help them with their marriage, but the real truth is we actually help them with their internal struggles. Mm. It's just manifest in their marriage, full transparency, <laughs> uh, everything that goes on in our life, it can be solved internal. And that's what we do. So that's, we give people the, the proper coping skills and real strategies to dig to that root and uncover what the heck is going on so that I, it's not manifesting my relationships or other areas of my life. And I actually have control over that inner self and I can realign something that I needed early on. And I wish there was something that I could have found to avoid all of this pain. Um, but it's a really powerful program. And my main goal is just to, to save as many lives as we possibly can and expanding that big goals. I, I don't know if I, I don't, I don't know if you want to hear about it, but it's uh, our goal is to reach a hundred million dollars uh, in revenue. And to be able to do that is, is we're going to need a big team and a, a big push on how many lives that we're saving. So we're on track to do 5 million this year. It's some special, man. So that's, that's my biggest focus is, is just continuing to grow that. And then maniac media, uh, we are supporting our brands. Wes Watson is a brand that we support, uh, Michael Francis. And so we're going to continue to do that and then launch our newsletter, which is the convicted, yeah. uh, which is meant to just serve people through telling story, inspirational stories, uh, that we can inspire to give hope and to give some guidance by us just being in the trenches and being able to turn our lives around. Uh, cause most of those guys that we, that I just mentioned have also had some pretty tough struggles in their life as well. Absolutely, man. I think, uh, I think some of our, of our brands here begin again, podcast and the convicted newsletters seem kind of aligned, you know, which is a uh, good thing for sure. Where is it? Is it ready? Where if someone wants to go, uh, get on the, on the online for, for your newsletter, where are we ready for that yet? 
we're not ready for it yet. We're, we're rebuilding our website. It'll be done a um, few months. It's it's going to be a pretty big launch for it, for us. But if you want to stay in the know, the best thing to do is just follow me on, on LinkedIn or Facebook. I don't really do Instagram and okay. starting with the threads, but that's, that's the best thing is, uh, is just follow me on one of the social medias and I'll be sure to, to launch the announcement and, and uh, get everybody in there when the time is right. I've been too busy building everybody else's brand. Now it's time to build my own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't know about you, man, but hundred million, uh, I see that in your future for well, for sure. If that's what you believe in, that's what I believe in. Cause you've overcome everything so far in your life and there's nothing that can stop you. I mean, you sound undeniable for sure. I appreciate that, man. And it's Julian Bryant, B R Y A N T on LinkedIn. That's where I found him. I mean, yes, I, we met in, in at the, at the conference, but that's where I found him as well. And, uh, you know, so being that it's a few months out, we're going to have to have, bring you back on. And, and I want to be just help you with the launch any way I can. And like I said, I'm, I'm new wow, to the awesome. podcast world. And, you know, my goal is to grow this audience. Like I said, to help one person every single day with the thought of the bigger, the audience, the more people we can help for sure. So I want to, I want to be a part of that. And um, so we'll have to have you back on. We'll do a little, when you're doing some of your launch and, and promote it for sure. Um, Thank you, man. Yeah. And any way I can support you, I'm, I'm here for you. No, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. So, you know, we could have closed this so many times because you had just so much awesome words of, of wisdom and knowledge for everyone out there. This is something I, I've been doing uh, lately. The last few guys I've had or girls I've had on the show, uh, I've had a little question. One little question, actually. It's you bump into yourself, 17, 18 year old Julian, or you get to pen a word, a, 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 a note to younger self. What are you telling younger Julian? You're at a gas station, you bump into him, and you see yourself at 17, 18 years old, right before you're about to get in that car with the guy and with the pistol, everything. What are you saying to him? Love yourself, man. Love yourself. You're not loving yourself right now for whatever reason. All the things that happened in your past with your dad growing up, you don't need anybody else to validate you. You have all the answers within yourself, but you have to love yourself and you have to accept that you're so much more than what, how you're currently living. I do that hopefully to get a reaction out of my uh, guest and to be perfectly honest, like you got me choked up with that for real. And so- I told you offline that, you know, these usually go an hour. I had a feeling I didn't want to talk to you for two hours and I do, but we're going to, uh, we're going to say goodbye, but we're going to promise each other. We're going to be back on and I'm going to bring you back on. I'm big in relationship building and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful that you came on today, Julian. I'm super grateful that, you know, you're in my life right now. And thank you so much for your message of inspiration, of hope, of that anyone can overcome the adversity that they think they have in their life. Yeah. Thank you, man. It's been a pleasure. No, nah, it's a pleasure. We're going to keep, keep close tabs on you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another powerful episode of the Begin Again podcast. We sincerely appreciate your time and support. We hope that today's conversation has ignited a spark within you, affirming that recovery is not only attainable, but can also be a wellspring of strength and resilience. Our ultimate goal is to make a difference in someone's life every single day. By sharing these stories of redemption, we strive to empower you and inspire you to unlock your fullest potential, facilitate positive transformations, and contribute to creating a better future for yourself, for your loved ones, and the world at large. If you know someone who could benefit from listening to our show, please share it with them. And if you resonate with our mission and feel compelled to do so, we would greatly appreciate your support through a five-star review following us on Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, The Begin Again Podcast. The more positive reviews we receive and the wider our message spreads, the greater our collective ability to help others realize that change is possible in their own lives. Thank you once again for being a part of our community. May you be blessed on your own journey of personal growth and transformation.